Hi. Sorry? Go. Go. Um, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to our talk. Um, just a little bit about us. So my name's Craig Dunn. I'm a freelance consultant and trainer, mostly specializing in puppets. Um, so I've been a community member for a very long time, probably since about 2008. And I wear many hats in my job, but I like to think of myself primarily as a problem solver. Um, I've got various musings on my blog, mostly about puppets. And if you want to follow me, I'm CrayfishX on Twitter. Hello, my, my, my name is Jan. Um, I'm also like Craig, a problem solver, and that's my profession. Uh, I'm also turning into a manager, and that's by accident mostly. Um, I've, for over a long time I've been trying to find the, the right moment to start use, using this project, and right now I'm starting. Um, I'm, I'm working at SafeSpring, which is an um, infrastructure uh, provider, and I try to make, make people happy. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, I just realized my presenter screen is not on my laptop, so I'm just going to put my clock on. So, <coughs> configuration management. We have a variety of tools to manage the components of our infrastructure, be those Ansible roles or puppet modules or chef recipes. And we're doing it with all the same goal to make, to reduce the burden of managing infrastructure. And today I'm going to talk about data. And I'm going to talk about data and then Jan here is going to demo some, some cool stuff that he's been doing in this space. Simple stuff, but cool. All the coolest stuff should be simple. Um, so what we mean about data, when we're managing infrastructure, we have a lot of this data, we have a lot of stuff that we care about. We're not so much talking about the, the, the functional things that configure our components, like the puppet modules, like the, the, the chef recipes, but all the data that feeds into that, that drives our infrastructure. And it raises a few questions when we talk about all this data, like where do we store this data, how do we query it, um, how do we avoid duplicating it as we start using different tools? And when we're thinking about infrastructure, what's the best way to express that data? So the problem as I've seen it is twofold. It starts with data being embedded in code, whether that code is your, your puppet modules, your chef recipes, your Docker files, there's, you know, there's code everywhere that drives our infrastructure. And then as our infrastructure grows and gets more diverse and spreads into different environments and different deployments, different locations, how we can effectively manage that data. So first let's look at embedding. When we embed our data in our code, our code becomes a lot more complex. We can no longer share that code, either in the community or with other teams and other business units in our organization. And it's also a high barrier to a simple task. So if you imagine something as simple as saying the time zone should be set to UTC, before configuration management came along, you could probably give that task to your most junior inexperienced sysadmin and trust that he had the expertise to go and do that immediately. And now with configuration management and we've embedded all this data deep within our code in, in nested conditionals, it requires a lot more skill to go and do what should be a very simple task. And the second part of the data problem is managing the data. It's fine when we just have a narrow view of one deployment, but infrastructure sprawls and it sprawls across different regions, different environments, different business streams, and in all of those nuances, the data is going to be different. And no matter how perfect you make your infrastructure, you will always hit edge cases. So let's take an example. We've seen this embodiment of all this data, all this stuff that we need to manage. We can find, we can deploy that out to our development environment without too much hassle. But then what happens is you need to take that, that same deployment, that same 
infrastructure configuration model, and now you need to deploy that out to your QA and your production environments. The functional process you're using to deploy out to these environments is the same, but there are nuances between these environments that's going to make the data different. And then later on, you need to deploy all three of these environments out to different data centers and different locations across the world. And again, the characteristics of all these different data centers is going to affect the data. And no matter how perfectly you think your infrastructure is designed, you're always going to get that special snowflake that doesn't quite fit into any particular box. Now, it's easy to think, and I've heard it a lot even this, this week, that with the, with the rise up of containerization and Docker and all this, that infrastructure complexity doesn't exist anymore, that it's somehow a thing of the past and we never have to worry about it again. And that's just not true. And particularly when you start dealing with different types of organizations, especially like um, financially regulated organizations, for example, they become a lot, lot more complicated. And I think in, uh, in Mark Burgess's talk yesterday, I think he he referred to people who manage physical infrastructure almost in the past tense, like we don't do that anymore, and I was doing it last week. <laughs> so, you know, this, this does exist and it is a problem. That, that's my business. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry? Uh, managing infrastructure, that's my business. Yes. I'm still doing it. So, so these complex environments, they, they, you know, they do still exist and we still need to cater for them. So as I said, I'm from a, a puppet background. And back in the early days of Puppet, this was a problem for me as well. And coming up with, with these disastrous anti-patterns to try and figure out how to get data into, into Puppet modules. And back, I was doing a, a contract back at the, the BBC in London with a hugely complex deployment across 15 or so different sites across the UK. And we inherited the the, the, the mother load of puppet code from that somebody else had written and we had to refactor it. And I did end up having some success with, with designing a new way to structure puppet code um, that became known as roles and profiles and became quite a popular way to structure code. But I was still left with this problem of data. You know, each site, each, deploy, sorry, each deployment site that we were pushing out to had very different requirements for how things should be configured in terms of the settings and the data. And I came up with some wonderfully creative anti-patterns in Puppet that will never see the light of day. And so I was trying to solve this problem. And in the Puppet world, this was solved by the release of a tool called Hira. So Hira was written by Ari Pena as a, as a third party tool to manage data lookups. Although it's eventually been Pulled into, the, pulled into the Puppet core, so it's actually the, it is the subsystem that handles data lookups in Puppet. And you can look up from multiple sources, from files, from databases. And there were, there were two key things that I think Hira brought that were really important when it comes to managing data for your infrastructure. And that's the concept of data separation and a way of looking up data in a hierarchical way, hierarchical lookups. So first, if we look at data separation, with data separation, we remove the complexity from our code and we put that data in a place that is built to handle data, not to handle code. The result of that is our code becomes reusable and easily shared, and there's minimal expertise required to manage our data values. So imagine the, the example I said earlier where, where simple tasks should be, able, should be accomplished by you know, your most junior sysadmin. They shouldn't need to go and learn a new configuration management tool to do what used to be a very simple task. And in the case of Hira, managing data becomes just a matter of putting things into YAML documents. YAML engineering. YAML engineering. <laughs> it's the future. <laughs> So the second thing that Hira brought us um, was the con this concept of hierarchical lookups. And this is where I want to focus on because Hira users might be very familiar with this, but users of other tools might not have, have seen this concept. 
So to describe hierarchical lookups in a non-infrastructure way, imagine that we have an, we're, we're dealing with data for an e-commerce site. And we decide we're going to sell globally to the whole world in US dollars. Now comes along another requirement that says for European countries, we're now going to bill in euros. But for the rest of the world, we're going to continue to bill in US dollars. And then the third requirement comes along that actually there's a few countries in Europe that are a bit different and we, we want to start billing in sterling for the United Kingdom and Swiss francs for Switzerland. So when you start thinking about this in, in terms of how do we resolve the data, what should the currency be, it's easy to start thinking that in terms of conditionals and logic and code, but what we really have is a really basic, simple hierarchy. We're saying once we know the country and the continent that we're looking up for, we can first say, is there a currency specifically for my country? And if there's not, then we say, well, how about for my continent that I'm part of? And if there's nothing defined there, then we fall back on this worldwide default. So what we need to know in order to do this type of lookup is the country and the continent. And in terms of hierarchical lookups, we call this the scope. So I use the word scope a lot in this talk, and it's, it's information that's used to determine how data is looked up. And in this simple example, the scope is just the country and the continent. And using that scope, we can look up the data. So we're not saying what is the value for currency. We're saying what is the value for currency in the context of this scope. And when we start thinking about lookups like that, we can start thinking about them in hierarchical ways. So this model of representing data in a hierarchical way really suits infrastructure. And if we think of how we express infrastructure data, we often start from the most granular and then move out to a global level. Something like this might be a, a good representation of how you might define your data. And when we're doing a hierarchical lookup, we'll often say, right, we'll start at the most granular level. So is there anything defined for my particular host name? Am I that special snowflake? And if we don't find any data there, then we move down to the next level, which may be the environment. So is there anything specific to my environment for this lookup key? And if there is, then we return that. If there isn't, then we fall down to location. And then finally, at the bottom level, we can have our, our global configuration data that's applicable to everything. And that will be the fallback. So what I sort of learned over the years is that managing Managing this data was getting harder. Um, certainly for me, I was, I'm, as a consultant, I've been going into a variety of different types of organizations, a lot of them financial, regulated, and the complexity from the business requirements makes this data a beast. And I've heard in the talks over yesterday, we were talking about VM sprawl, and we're talking about container sprawl, and I think we're starting to see sort of data sprawl. You know, it's getting hard to actually figure out how to model this stuff. So, there also seemed to be a lack, of, a lack of generic tooling in this space. You know, yes, yes, Hira had solved many problems for Puppet, but Puppet's not the only tool out there. And then there was Balwars, who were sitting in front of me. So I was, I was doing a, a contract for uh, Balwars, doing some consulting for them, and they came to me with some some very complicated requirements around different business units wanting to manage different parts of their application deployment themselves, but under the same umbrella of our, our big, all-encompassing puppet infrastructure. And there were a few challenges with that that we were finding we couldn't do with Hira. And we, we tossed around a few ideas, we tossed around hacking up some weird backends, and then I mentioned that I've got this thing that I've been working on in my spare time that's kind of not quite there yet and sitting on my laptop. Um, and 
would they care to sponsor an open source project? And they did. So this is where back in 2015, um, we released this tool called Jerichia. It's a hierarchical data lookup tool. Um, Jerichia.io is the website. It's pronounced Jerichia. Everyone always asks me that. Naming things is really hard. Um, if anyone is interested, fun fact, Spanish for hierarchy is jerarquía, and that's where the name kind of derives from. So the goals of Jerichia was to be decoupled from any particular configuration management tool, to be pluggable and extendable. I'm a great believer in, in software that the, the community can take on and add to, and when they hit their edge cases, they can develop around rather than having to hack the tool itself. And flexible configuration. So what we found with a lot of the solutions currently, which was the whole reason why, why Balwas had issues, is that there were, the tooling out there wasn't flexible enough to be able to bend to their requirements. So the features of Jerich here, it's standalone and communicates over a REST API. So although Jerich is written in Ruby, it can integrate into any tool that's capable of talking HTTP. We can look up data from a variety of different data sources. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, so the example I used about um, a, a, hierarchy, a hierarchy that suits infrastructure was just a generic example on a slide. With Jericho, you can define your own hierarchical structure that best suits how your infrastructure looks. And there's a lot of flexibility around lookup behavior, mostly to do with the fact that the configuration is done in like a Ruby, Ruby DSL, um, so you're not limited in a, in a very constrained configuration language. Excuse me. Uh, I think we should mention that the lookup behavior isn't then part of your code, but part of configuration of this tool. Yes. I think that's an important point. Yeah, the look, so the lookup behavior is configured within, within generic here, not within your application or your... Which makes your real code simpler. Yes. So at the core of Jerich here, we're dealing with lookups. So a lookup request into Jerich here will contain the key that you want to look up. Um, Jerich has the concept of a namespace. So if you imagine the key might be port and the namespace might be Apache, where you've got all your Apache. In that namespace, you have all of your keys for Apache. And the scope of the lookup, which we talked about before. So the information about the requester that helps us resolve the data. <coughs> and a lookup is run against a Jerichia policy. So Jerichia policies, they're written in Ruby and they're a container for one or more lookups. And we use lookups within these policies to query a data source, get the data back and send it back to the requester. So the data source, the thing that reaches out and finds data is pluggable. Um, there are three that ship with Jerichia. There's the, the file data source, which will be fairly familiar to Hari users and we'll cover that in a minute. There's also HTTP if you want to configure Jerichia to look up your data from any HTTP endpoint. And as of 2.5, which released last week, there's integrated console data source, so you can store all of your data within console. And, or you can write your own. Um, I will fully admit that the documentation on the website doesn't cover writing data sources very well yet. Um, there is a, a template that I've been working on on GitHub with comments in the code to try and explain it, and I will follow it up with better documentation around developing your own data sources. So looking at the file data source, excuse me, the file data source searches through a file system hierarchy made up of data stored in YAML or JSON files. Typically we'd store all this in version control, so in Git, and then have something deploy there. And if you look at an example, so with our previous example of our infrastructure hierarchy, where we've got host name, environment, location, and common, with the file data source, this would be represented as files, so we would have, under host name, we could have a directory for our particular host, Apache.yaml. 
if the key we're looking for is not in that file, then the data source will go to the next level, and then the next level, and the next level, until it finds the data. So we've mentioned Jerichia policies. Um, Jan's going to do a demo where he's going to cover some of this, so I won't go into huge amounts of detail, only just to... This is an example of a fairly simple Jerichia policy. So this is, what, this is the policy file you write to control the behavior of your lookup. And here, if you've not, it's written in Ruby, but it's fairly basic. So we have a policy block, and then contained within that policy block, we can have one or more lookups. And then for each lookup, which are run in order, we call a particular data source. In this case, we're saying the file data source. And we see here this search path is an array which will get searched through in order, which defines our hierarchy. So when we're looking up a key, let's say from the Apache namespace, we'll start off looking in apache.yaml under that directory, then we'll fall down to environment, and then we'll fall down to common. So a quick overview of this, kind of the anatomy of a, of a Jericho lookup in its entirety. So all, all things will start with a request, and the request consists of the namespace and the key that we're looking up. Normally with the request, we'd also have the scope information, so things like the environment, the location, etc. Or that could be pulled in from another source. Jericho does support the idea of uh, a, a pluggable scope handler. So in the case of Puppet, you don't have to send all of the facts in with the lookup. You can actually tell Jericho to pull that from PuppetDB, for example. And then within the scope of the lookup, we've got plugins that run that can read and modify the scope and I should say, and the request. So we can, we can do things to the request on the fly. Then we've got the data source, which goes and queries the data for you. And then no matter what data source you use to get your data, all results can be passed through what we call output filters, which can be quite powerful. So you can, you can munge and transpose your data on the fly, no matter where you, which data source you're getting it from, before the answer is finally sent back to the requester. Yeah, and I want to make a point of contrasting that to like um, the data dig stuff in Hira 5, for the people that know that. Ah. So we don't have to, I don't have time to run through all of the, the advanced features in Jericho here, but I just wanted to highlight a couple. Um, so here we see a much more complicated example of a lookup. So I have a policy, and this policy contains two lookups. And we have these three methods in Jericho lookups called confine, exclude, and stop. And they can actually be very useful for isolating lookups or controlling when particular lookups get invoked. So in this example, we have a lookup called Ireland as the first lookup, but we're confining this to be um, location island and the namespace being Apache. So this lookup will only get run if, if, we, if, 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 it's, if the location matches island and our namespace is Apache. If those two conditions don't match, it will never run and we'll just fall down to the next one. But the presence of the stop method there says if this lookup is valid, so if it is island and if it is Apache, even if there is no data, don't fall down to the next level, just stop there. So these three methods actually add a lot of power into a Jericho policy for, for um, dictating the, the flow of lookups and when lookups should be invoked and when they shouldn't be. There's some data that we manage that we want to keep secret. So if you imagine if you have all of this infrastructure data for dev through production and it's all in Git, you probably don't want your database passwords in there as well. Um, Jerichia tries not to reinvent the wheel and become an encryption provider itself. So we use Vault. Um, Vault has this concept known as a transit feature, which effectively is like cryptography as a service. So Vault doesn't store the data, but you can use it to encrypt and decrypt data on the fly. And then we can store that encrypted data in whatever data source that we want. Uh, I can add that uh, since my team is too stupid to use Vault, uh, it's too complicated for us, we, we will write a uh, backend for password store to make this uh, approachable for people that think what is too complicated. We await your pull request with anticipation. Yes, it will happen. 
Um, so yeah, you can write, so, so Jericho ships with Vault as the default um, encryption provider, but that again, in the, the ethos of always making things pluggable, that is something you can swap out and swap in some other technology to handle that. And also merge behavior. So we said when we're going through a hierarchy, a hierarchical lookup, we will take the first result and return it. And that's not necessarily always what you want to be doing. So in the case, if you look at this example, we have uh, a common, so we have users that are configured across our entire estate. And what we want to do higher up in the hierarchy is just add more users. We don't want to have to duplicate all that data. So using merge behaviors in Jeric here, you can say for a particular value to, to not just stop at the first one and continue traversing through the hierarchy, gather up all instances of what you find, and then return everything together in one large array or hash. So there's, there's a lot of powerful stuff in Jeric here which I just don't have time to run through here. So there's, there's plugins which I touched on, there's schemas which, can, um, which relate to the merge behavior stuff, um, a lot more about data sources, output filters, and the API itself is all on jerichia.io. So please do, please do read that. And quickly before I hand over to Jan, there's a third data problem that I see here. And that's, my, my, this is my, my perception, this wasn't necessarily true, but my perception when people started saying DevOps was that it was like Puppet and Chef users and then everybody else. And fast forward to today and that seems to be a really different landscape and we've got a whole bunch of tools that we're managing our infrastructure with. And this, this is not a bad thing, there's been a, a lot of great innovation in this space. So we use all these tools to manage our infrastructure, not just for config management, but orchestration, monitoring, provisioning. And all these different tools have their own data patterns, their own way of handling data. But the actual data we're dealing with is the same thing. We only have one set of data and we're just putting it all over the place. So the main aim of Jeric here is to be a centralized source for all our lookups. And um, we've talked about back-end integrations with data sources. There's currently a couple of front-end integrations, so it can be, it can be used as a Puppet Hira 5 back-end, and more recently, an Ansible lookup plugin. Um, and I would be very keen to get more Ansible users involved. I'm not from an Ansible background. There might be better ways of doing it than what we've done. And there's the potential for many more. Um, I just want to add one quick thing <laughs> that we have a website, we have a logo and I was at the bar last night in the social and I was being nagged that I didn't bring any stickers or anything like that. <laughs> um, and then when I was on my way into the conference this morning, I spotted this on Twitter. So thank you very much to Lucas from Puzzle for turning around stickers for Jerick here in 12 hours flat and <laughs> by all means come down and pick one up after the demo. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're getting ready, so... This one? Oh, do you want to come there? No, I'll, I'll, sit. I'll need to sit, I think. There, yeah. Do you hold on? Do you need this mic? Yes, please. Somebody tell me how this works. <laughs> that way. I guess. Craig, you need to help me. <laughs> uh, no? Yeah, we we'll put it more down. Hello. Yeah. Works. Works? Yeah. Yes, nice, thanks. Craig, you can still have this mic here if you have any comments. So, yeah, it works, it works. we're on the screen. Okay, if anybody here sits with a laptop, you could quickly check out that the demo repo, demo repo there is going to be a Vagrant box. So if you don't have the box, probably don't start downloading it. <laughs> but at least you can, you can look at the code. Um, it's a really simple demo. Um, first, I'm just going to demo the command line client for Jerakia. It doesn't use any uh, API. It Curies directly uh, the data source locally. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. And before, before that, I'm going to show 
uh, the policy that I'm currently go using for this demo, which will be in the configuration. <coughs> and this is just the default policy that ships with Jerkia, and it has uh, a tree where host name is the most specific level than environment, and then common, which will be all the defaults. So then on the right hand, right hand side here, I've uh, done a recursive grep of all the data to show what files con uh, have what content, and this is all YAML, which we love. So you can see there, um, at the common level, we have different namespaces. We have one for AWS, one at CD, one HTTP, TPD, and a management one. So the first thing I'm going to do is just to look up without providing any uh, scope, I'm going to look up the value of uh, port in the HTTPD namespace. So let's try, try doing that. <coughs> so that, then it's um, the command line tool is really friendly. I'm still learning it, so I could do like this. Um, Craig's written really good help for all the options. Thanks for that. So. These are all the options, and I'll just do a really look up, port, look up. So uh, now, no prices for guessing, but this value should be probably 443. Yes, that's correct. So that's the default value, and unless um, I have any scope that overrides it, it will stay 443. So now, uh, if you can see on the right, you'll see that in the dev environment, the port value is 80. So let's try and provide that as, a, as the scope data. Then we just put like this. And then now the lookup has some scope information and the results should be different. And it works. Nice. <laughs> uh, so this is the basic principle. Um, and from here, you can move on to doing a lot of different advanced lookups. But the most common thing to do that's different from the default is probably to do um, a, a merge lookup. And then I need to cheat a little bit and see in my file. I think that's the management IPs. I mean, yeah. So here are some examples of how I could do um, the other kind of lookup that's common. So <coughs> that's type cascade, which means instead of returning um, only the first match in, from the scope, you continue and the lookup also to include the scopes that are higher up in there. Or is it higher or lower in the hierarchy? <laughs> I'm always confused with what's up and down. <laughs> I would say higher would be higher, more granular. Higher, higher, OK, higher. Yeah. So let's try one of these. These are Norwegian host names. <laughs> yes. So what happens here is that it will first uh, return the most specific data, then continue the lookup, and also return um, the other scopes. Uh, and it will then return an array. But we could do better than this even. We could put, what's the option for output, <laughs> Jason? Dash dash output. That Dash out it. Nice. Dash out, yeah. So if I do it like this, it will return a JSON array, which is quite neat. Or YAML as well, you can have. Yeah, well, let's try that. I found a bug <laughs> yesterday, but this works. <laughs> so that's quite neat when you need to integrate with other tooling uh, for values. Um, and uh, since we don't have a lot of time, I'll just stop with the uh, command line example here and move on to the next example, which is an Ansible client. Or 
it's on it's a client for Jirakia and rest the rest rest API uh, and a lookup plugin for Ansible. So now let's see. Uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, set up um, an API key so to talk with the server. They should mm, create. create, yes. <laughs> Still helping me here. Create, yes. And then we have that. And in order for a integration to work, I need to provide this to Ansible, so the lookup, lookup plugin can contact the API. And that should be in this file. Also here is the setup of the variables I will use as scope variables. Oh, that was wrong. As scope variables when I'm doing lookups from inside Ansible. So this. So those are cert name and environment. And I'm using Ansible's fact mechanism to provide them. Um, just to make sure, I guess I could copy them again. And for you to see what, what they are, cert name is a puppetism, I guess. Um, so that's the cert name. And Ansible will pick that up. And the environment should be this one, which is production. So then let's try running this. Really simple. Oh, we could probably have a look on, on the at the lookup plugin itself, which is Python, of course. Uh, it's. Uh, I think this was. Is this, it, was this your first time writing this Python is the code? Very <laughs> first thing I've ever written in Python. <laughs> Applause. You did well. <laughs> the only thing that's missing is tests, but we don't care. <laughs> it works. So uh, it's quite simple. Uh, it's just a regular uh, Python requests. Uh, API client and does what it needs to do in order to be a lookup plugin for Ansible. So this is not hard to write. Anybody that has written any amount of code could probably easily write a Jirakia client in their language of choice. <coughs> I'm going to write one for Bash, so that's going to be fun. Okay, then let's try running. So that was just it. Okay, I forgot showing um, connection refused. Okay, maybe the server isn't running. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> it's not always <laughs> DNS, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> now let's look at the playbook first. It's really simple, only debug statements to show that the uh, variable <coughs> variables get set. And uh, there you can see how the syntax is, is with the lookup plugin. So just a name and then the key for what you want to look up. And we uh, found that we made a mistake. If you, if you look at the variable name that I'm going to look up, it's, it's called HTTP slash uh, port. Probably for Ansible, it would be, make more sense to make that slash an underscore. <laughs> so we're going to fix that. And now let's hope it runs. It does. Nice. Okay. And now, if I change um, this um, node to be in the dev environment, mm -hmm. we should get port 80, which I hope we will get. And I think so. You. It works. So, uh, as you probably can see, this has some potential for Ansible goodness. Uh, the worst thing about using Ansible, at least when we've been using Puppet before, is uh, the impossibility of trying to understand how variables override each other. <laughs> and uh, I've read the documentation and I tried to get it working or to, to have like defaults and overrides and, and, and different environments and it doesn't make sense to me 
this does make sense to me. So uh, all or Ansible code is going to be driven, or, or variables for, for or Ansible code is going to be dri driven this way. And I'm really confident that that's going to be fine. And I also have um, another um, example of Ansible, the Ansible integration, which is called here, run2. Um, what this, what this one does is, if you already have some ex existing Ansible code, you could use um, a command line option to playbook, which is called dash "-e", and it will always uh, override all the variables that you have specified in other places. And this way, you, um, because the lookup plugin all, also works for variable, variable files, you could easily test if um, Jerakia is a good approach for you just by using variable files like this and see where it gets you. So this is like a hash from file uh, with a lookup for one of the values inside the hash. So let's try running that. Yes, it works. It says we included an external var file in this run, and it just dumps the value of that var file. Yeah. When I get got this working, I was pretty happy because it solves uh, the management of variables in Ansible for me. Um, also, another thing I'm doing is that I'm using templating. Uh, which is really ugly and one of those things we shouldn't talk about, according to Twitter. <laughs> uh, but it's still really useful. And um, uh, right now I'm writing a tool for CI or internal CI that will use templating to generate uh, packer configurations uh, from, from data in Jerakia. And I have a really simple example of how, how that could work. Uh, right now, it's just wrapping the command line client of Jerakia, but there is other ways of doing that. I could, I, I'm going to use, reuse the Ansible uh, puppet, uh, Python code and, and create a library in Python that we will put on PyPy, so you can download just the library and then do lookups from wherever you are in code. So that's the plan, and then I'm using uh, an internal Python tool to generate my packing, packer configs from, from that. And that way, I can. I'm, I don't need to use environment variables or anything strange in order to get my packer builds to be. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier to to make your pack, your packer builds be really really simple and then just feed data to them as needed. And this will be an example that show show how you could do that. Uh, I could probably just. How are we on time? Mm, about out, I think. About out, okay. <laughs> then, the, then I'll activate the diff, I guess. Packer.json example versus Packer.json J2. So this is Genia 2 templates. And, and the example one is the one of the Packer website for the AWS provider. And these are the changes I did to it in order for it to be a uh, Genia 2 template. Um, it's not really hard. Uh, and then I can uh, generate templates from Jerakia data. And this last thing I'll show is that I can validate it like this. I guess that should work. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I really hope there are more people than me interested in this. And if you want to help out in the project, we, we really um, we are looking for people <laughs> to help out, uh, and we also have plans. I have plans for writing um, a provider in Golang for a uh, for Terraform, so that I can use data from Jerakia in my Terraform runs directly and stop using hard coded data in there, which really sucks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.